Let the words of my mouth, let the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. All of us, of all ages, bear wisdom and gifts that are specific to the generational backdrop from which we emerge. By listening to one another from generation to generation, we are able to hear the truth of God that transcends our own experiences, which enables us to move forward in faith together. For the next five weeks here at First Congregational Church, we'll be focusing on the experiences and the insights that each of the four generations represented in our faith community, builders, boomers, millennials, Gen Xers, have to contribute to deepening our understanding of the truth of God. This morning, each of our three pastors will share some of their reflections on how God has moved in their lives across the generations here at First Congregational Church. All right, so since I hail from Koinonia, I just need to let everyone know the rules in Koinonia when it comes to sermon time. If you like something I say, say amen. amen. <laughs> and if you don't like something I say, just be quiet. All right, so um, <laughs> all are welcome here most of the time. Okay, no, I'm kidding. Um, I am really grateful to be here today with all of you at One Body Worship. I want to say a special welcome to those of you who have come through the Garden of Dreams community. We are so grateful to have you. You are another representation of our one body. We consider you family. Welcome. I've been thinking all week about, well, I've been crying all week about dropping my little ones off to this preschool every day. You can pray for me about that. Um, but every day that I drop them off, I'm just so mindful of what it means to put my children in the care of other people. And the importance, the privilege, the power, and the responsibility of that. And so, as a parent, as a pastor, I just want to say a special thank you, and then we'll get back to you later. All right? So, um, I think one of the reasons that God calls us into community one of the main reasons that God calls us into community is so that we can get the love here that we didn't get in our formative years. I know that there are some of you who got all the love you needed in your formative years. I am not one of you. All right? I didn't have grandparents in my life, and I honestly didn't even know that I didn't know that I didn't know that I was missing something. So for me, the love of community has meant being loved by and learning to love people of the builder generation. Now that I have children of my own who have active, loving, present grandparents, three sets of them actually, I cannot help but lament what I missed as a child and I thank God for how she is healing the gaps with people in this community. There are two women from the Builder Generation who are a part of this community that bless and enrich my life, and my hope is that I do the same for them, and I'm going to talk about them. You ready? I'm going to talk about them. Are you ready? Yeah. All right. About three years ago, a very small, shining, white-haired lady poked her head into my office and said, I want to tell you my spiritual story. It was totally out of the blue. Most people text message me when they want to tell me something. Long gone are the days when most people just stopped by the pastor's office, at least in my generation. So I'd seen her around church, but the directness of her request and that she actually wanted to talk to me was surprising. 
We set a date, and a few days later, Marge Meisner filled me in about her upbringing, her experience during the Depression, marriage life, her children, and most extensively, the various religious experiences she'd had throughout her life. What struck me profound about Marge's journey was her willingness to keep seeking a spiritual path no matter how hard her relationships with institutional religion had been along the way. Marge knows the spirit of truth, peace, and love, and she hasn't given up on finding a community that embraces and practices all of them. That day I learned two things. I'm not going to look at you because I'm going to start crying. <laughs> I learned two things that day. We had a lot in common, and we had a whole lot of differences. And I loved that. I loved that we had a lot in common and that we had a lot of differences. I loved that we sat face to face and we shared our stories and we explored each other's lives. I love that she honored me by coming in and seeking to understand. I love Marge Meisner. She is good to me. She is good to this community. She is the goodness of God and the life of one fabulous human being. Thank you for how you have blessed and enriched my life. Amen. Amen. The other woman I want to talk a bit about today is a woman by the name of Jerry Sharons. Is she here? I don't think she's here today. I was looking around. No? Okay. So Jerry lives over at the Reflections over there on uh, Helmer Road. And I don't get to see her as often as I would like, but when I walk away from a visit with Jerry, I am always filled with gratitude and awe. Jerry lives in a place where residents are being treated for Alzheimer's and dementia, though she always makes sure to tell me that she isn't there for that. She's there to help take care of the residents who are there for that. She tells me about her friend Gayla Nelson, another beloved daughter of this congregation who faithfully visits her all the time and how much our faith community means to her. Jerry tears up when she tells me about the role of the grace of God in protecting and preserving her over her life. I tear up when she tells me for the fifth or sixth or seventh time the story about how she declined to marry a very, very nice young man early on so that she could pursue a degree at Hope College and become a kindergarten teacher, which she says was the best decision she ever made. On Friday when I visited her, she told me about being born in the Great Depression and how she didn't have access to routine medical care due to the financial issues facing her family, and so she was delivered by a midwife. And then she yelled, I love midwives! <laughs> we have that in common. We have a lot in common. We love the Beatitudes, we love children, we love education, the love of community, and the beauty of nature. Before I left her room on Friday, Jerry gave me a children's book from her library called Listen to God's Quiet Things, and she signed it to Aurora, Isaiah, and Emily Joy. Generation to generation, God's love endures. A love that spans generations is special, it is sacred. Between the love I feel and receive from women like Marge and Jerry and a host of others, I sense the part of me that lacked elder care and grandparent love as a child is being healed. I can only hope that intergenerational grace goes both ways. Amen. Mm. Well, friends, I've been thinking about four years ago what was going on around here and the ways in which my experience four years ago seems to be uh, uh, manifesting again now. So four years ago, I saw this church community become galvanized around planting the new koinonia community from within. And we didn't even know it was going to be called koinonia then, but there was some sense that that we wanted to birth a new worshiping community from inside this church, not just plant it somewhere else, as is so often the model. It's, you know, we, we, we get some energy around doing something, so we go away and then do it out there. But here the model was different. We wanted to plant it within. 
And that was four years ago. I saw this community become energized around that project and volunteer time and give countless hours and work and showing up to stuff and visioning and strategizing and doing all of this. And then the four years since, after we planted and launched Koinonia, I've seen this church become equally galvanized around planting our Garden of Dreams community preschool and child care. Volunteers have been at the foundation of both movements, selflessly committing their financial resources, their time, their sweat, their blood, and their spirit to the new growth about to take hold. Amen. (laughs) At this time, I have a few words to say about one of those volunteers from both times who has taught me so much about generosity and possibility, and how to pave the way for the Holy Spirit to brave her fire among us. Now, Brent Reed didn't know that I was going to talk about him today. He doesn't like to be in the spotlight. In fact, he has said time and again that he much prefers being in the background, helping things move forward by supporting them from behind. But for all of his humility, he is practically omnipresent in the ways this church has come to utilize his gifts. Can you hear me now? Brent handpicked and probably donated most of the equipment that is coming between my voice through these speakers and getting out to you. Those of you who will watch this on YouTube later can do so because of the hours Brent donates in formatting and uploading the video week after week after week. We run FCC's business in our offices using the phones and the wireless internet Brent personally installed. And when I first started consulting here, I casually mentioned that there were some technical limitations to the previous electric piano we had been using in the sanctuary. Brent casually asked me what might work a little better. And then the next week when I visited, a new keyboard was waiting in the sanctuary. Amen. But it's not just that Brent is generous with his skills and resources, and he is generous with his skills and resources. Brent is also generous with his spirit, with his positive energy, always willing to imagine what could be rather than retreat into pragmatic carefulness. Again and again, he keeps telling me, we'll find a way. We will find a way. We can find a way to do that. That crazy thing you want to do with the a cappella singers in different parts of the sanctuary? We'll find a way. You want to mic the violin? We'll find a way. You need to mix the drummer's voice into the singer's patches over here? We'll find a way. Anything's possible. Anything's possible. Earlier this week, Tom told me that one of the predominant themes of the baby, baby boomer generation is its unbridled optimism. You can kind of hear that reflected in even the protest songs of the generation. People, get ready. Imagine how it will be if everybody gets together and tries to love one another. All I am saying is give peace a chance and we shall overcome someday. There is some resilient, proudly hopeful, serious optimism, not just pie-in-the-sky optimism, serious optimism, unbridled in this generation. And Brent Reed has it in droves. And he pours it into everything he touches. Now, my generation is not what you would necessarily say uh, unbridled optimist (laughs) generation. Um, I I do not necessarily walk around with the sense of all things being possible. I walk around a lot of the times with a sense of all the things that are going wrong. 
So I need you in my life, Brent. I need you, all you people in my life who bring that sense of positive possibility. This is something that I and I think others in my generation need from the generations that came before us. These past several weeks, as Garden of Dreams has come closer and closer to fruition, Brent has been spotted in the three-year-old and toddler rooms working his carpentry magic. He's hand-building loft spaces for the kiddos that create additional play and storage space. And Jeannie Reed, for her part, has been leading the volunteers in planting the actual gardens in the play lot area. It is not a coincidence that whenever something amazingly vital is going on around here, this family has a hand in it. Amen. Brent, you've been a mentor to me in the ways of faithful generosity and positive possibility. You most often offer your gifts in a way that avoids the spotlight. Actually, you're usually the one operating the spotlight. (laughs) But your gifts are truly vital to FCCBC, to our ministries, to Garden of Dreams, to music, personally, to me. So thank you for all you have taught me about how to offer one's gifts in such a way that the Holy Spirit can move freely here. Amen. Well, these past few years of my ministry, I've been deeply blessed to be working with two amazing young colleagues who straddle the millennial and Gen X generations. They are two phenomenally talented pastors, two deeply committed people of faith, and two people who give me deep hope for the future of the world. Of the world. I use those words with deliberate intentionality. They give me deep hope, not for this church, not for the city of Battle Creek, but for the future of the world. I say that because one of the greatest things that I have come to appreciate about Emily Joy and Tom is how deeply connected their lives are to the lives of people beyond this place. Sometimes I get frustrated when they're doing this in the middle of a conversation. or when they discreetly turn their head over to check the screen of their cell phone just to see the latest text message that popped up, or when they're updating their Facebook page during a staff meeting, (laughs) or worship planning. But because of the technology, that they have grown up with. They have always been connected with people everywhere. The world is literally in the palm of their hands. Literally. When I was growing up, if I wanted to know something about Ferguson, Missouri, I basically had three options. I could go to the Encyclopedia Britannica and see if there was an entrance. 
Or I could wait for my local newspaper, the Allentown Call Chronicle, to carry a story about Ferguson, Missouri, on the national news section. Or I could listen to Walter Cronkite. Tell me what happened today in Ferguson, Missouri. If I ever heard anything about Ferguson, Missouri, it would have come from one perspective. Someone like me, a white, European, middle-class male, reporting their observations on what they noticed happening there. Consequently, I grew up fairly isolated, fairly insulated, fairly sheltered from the rest of the world. But Tom and Emily Joy and their generational peers have always had instant access to unlimited and unedited information available to them through the World Wide Web from anywhere on the planet, instantly. They have come of age in an era when anyone with a cell phone or with an iPad or with a laptop connected to the Internet could share their perspective on anything with everyone. It is inconceivable to Emily Joy, to Tom, to their generational peers, that there could be just one perspective on anything. In fact, they inherently mistrust information that comes from just one source. including me. <laughs> they want to hear multiple perspectives from many different people who experience the same set of circumstances from profoundly different vantage points. And they want to know whose voice isn't being heard who doesn't have a seat at the table, who has been excluded from power and why. Because they are always seeking multiple perspectives, they are mindful of social systems and power dynamics and cultural contexts. When Michael Brown was violently killed, they understood why African Americans reacted differently to the police shooting than white Americans. They aren't afraid to talk about race. They aren't afraid to talk about class. They aren't afraid to talk about culture or age or gender or sexual orientation and how all of those factors influence the way people view and behave towards each other. In the church's founding story, the Pentecost story that we heard this morning from the second chapter of Acts, God made a promise. I will pour out my spirit on what? All flesh. All flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young ones and your elders. They shall dream dreams. They shall see visions. The prophetic message that I hear over and over again from Tom and from Emily Joy is that there are always multiple 
perspectives to take into consideration, multiple voices to hear, multiple experiences to honor and respect. They know that the world is not divided into good people and bad people. They know the world is divided into people who have access to power and people who do not. They know the truth of Frederick Douglass' observation that power concedes nothing without struggle. And they are willing to join the struggle for the common good. They know that we cannot afford to continue framing conflict in terms of winners and losers. They know that if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. They know that our individual welfares are collectively bound. They know that vision is three-dimensional. It must be viewed from every angle. It must be studied from every perspective. It must be shaped by everyone's inputs. Because their lives are so deeply connected to the lives of people beyond their own local tribe, these folk are not lone rangers. They are great at building broad coalitions, making sure everyone has a place at the table, mobilizing diverse groups of people around a shared belief that life can be better for everyone, more loving, more generous, more merciful, more inclusive. That's what gives me such deep hope for the future of the world. Hear it again, in the last days it will be, God declares, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your youth shall see visions. And all you elders shall dream dreams. The founding story of the church is an intergenerational story. We've told just a few stories this morning. What are your stories? People of every age have divine visions and dreams and wisdom and truth to share. If you are sitting in this room today and you've got breath filling your lungs, you have a story to share. In our culture, we often talk about each other across the generations. Our differences often divide us and set us against each other, but here in Christ's church, we are called to speak to and with each other. Generation to generation, offering and receiving the truth of God that has been revealed to us through all of our life. We hope all of you, all of you, all flesh, will join us in these next four weeks at First Congregational as we explore these generational truths together. Let God's people say amen. Amen.